Data is the digital world's most precious resource. And with Backblaze, an easy-to-use cloud storage provider, you can make sure your data is truly secure and available. Whether it's music, documents, photos, or anything else, Backblaze offers an unlimited computer backup solution. Plus, everything is accessible worldwide via web and mobile applications. Backblaze backs up your entire Mac or PC, and it's just $7 per month. Your data is everything. Back it up, access it, and use it with Backblaze. For a 15-day free trial, visit backblaze.com slash holidays. Sci-fi, the world that can be Clifford D. Semenek. The tracks went... Up one row and down another, in those rows, the via plants had been sheared off an inch or two above the ground. The radar had been methodical. It had not wandered about haphazardly, but had done an efficient job of harvesting the first ten rows west side of the field, then, having eaten its fill, angled off the, into the bush. It had not been long ago, for the soil still trickled down the great pug marks sunk deep into the finely cultivated loom. Somewhere a sawmill bird was whirring for a log, and down in one of the foam choked ravines, a choir chatterers was clicking through a ghastly morning song. It was going to be a sculpture for a day, of a day. Already the smell of desiccated dust was rising from the ground in the glare of the holy rising sun, dancing off the bright leaves of the Buddha trees, making it appear as if the bush was filled with a million flashing mirrors. Gavin Duncan hauled a bird banana from his pocket and mopped his face. No, mister, said Sir Kerner, the former foreman of the farm. You cannot do it, mister. You do not hurt a Cynthia. Hell, I don't, said Duncan. He spoke in English and not the native tongue. He stared out across the bush, a far expanse, flat expanse of sown, cured grass interspersed with thickets of hewless scrub and thorn, and occasional groves of trees, cross, crisscrossed by treacherous ravines as body with infrequent water holes. <coughs> <coughs> We've been murderous out there, he told himself, but he shouldn't take it too long. The beast probably would lay up shortly after its pre-dawn feeding. He'd overhaul it for in an hour or two, but if he failed to overhaul it, then he must keep on. Dangerous, Sigara pointed out. No one hurts the Cynthia. I do, Duncan said, and speaking now in a relative tongue language, I hurt anything damages my crop. A few nights more of this, there will be nothing left. Jamming the bandana back into his pocket, he tilted his tap low across his eyes, across the sun. It might be a long chase, mister. It's a sunk season now. If you were caught out there. Now listen, Duncan said, short, told it sharply. Boy, come. You feast one day, you then starve for days on end. Now you'll eat every day. I like that. You like that, the doctor. Before you got sick, you die. Now you get sick. I doctor you. You live, you stay, you like staying one place instead of wandering all around. Mister, we like all this, said Zagara, but we do not hunt the Cynthia. We do not hunt the Cynthia, we all lose this, Duncan pointed out. We don't, I don't make a crop, I'm licked. I have to go away, well, then what happens to you? We will grow the corn ourselves, that's a laugh, said Duncan. You know it is, I won't, I wouldn't kick your backsides all day long, you wouldn't do a lick of work. If I leave, you'll go back to the bush. Let's go and get that Cynthia. But he's such a little one, mister. He's such a little young one. It's scarcely worth the trouble. It should be. It would be a shame to kill it. Probably probably just slightly smaller than the horse, thought Duncan, watching the relative closely. He's scared, he told himself. He's scared, dry and spitless. Besides, you must have been, been most hungry. Surely, mister... Even Cynthia has the right to eat. Not for my crop, said Duncan savagely. You know why we grow the vera, don't you? You know it's a great medicine. The berries that it grows have m- 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 cures those who are sick inside their heads. My people need the medicine, need it very badly. And there is what is more out there. He swept his arm towards the sky. Out there, you, they pay attention, pay him very much for it. Now, mister, I tell you this, Duncan said gently. You either dig me up a barrow runner 
to go trekking for me, or you can can all get out. The kit could have ruled all of you. I can get other tribes to work for the farm. No, Mr. Zabarura screamed in desperation. You have your choice, Duncan said, told it coldly. You pull it back towards the field, towards the house. Not much for houses yet. Not a great deal better than a native shack. But somebody, but somebody would be, he told himself, let him sell copper to, and he'd build a house that would really be a house. It'd be a bar and a swimming pool and a garden filled with flowers. At last, after years wandering, have a house and broad acres and, and everyone. But not, not, not just some lousy tribe would, would call it him Mr. Duncan, Dun- Grevin Duncan, planter, he said to himself, like the sound of it, planter of the planet, Wayland Lord. But what if the Sevier came back night after night and ate the Vavia plants? He glanced over his shoulder and saw that Zakira was racing for the native village. Call their bluffs, Duncan informed himself with satisfaction. Came out of the field and walked across the yard, heading for the house. Out, one of the well, well, short well shirts was hanging on the wall, clothesline, limp in a breathless morning. Damn that man, the man, thought Duncan. Out there mucking about with those soupy natives, asking, always ask questions, always underfoot, already to be fair about it. That was Stoke Wales' job. That was the sociology people had sent him out to do. Duncan came up, the sh- came up to the shack, pinched the door open and entered Stockwell, stripped to his waist, where wo- was at the wash bench, breakfast cooking on the stove with elderly natives acting as cook. Duncan strolled across the room, took down the heavy rifle from its peg, he slapped the action open, slapped it shut again. Stockwell reached for the towel. What's going on, he asked. Cynthia's got, Cynthia got in the field. Sophie, kind of animal, said Duncan. It ate ten rolls of Vora. Big, little, what are its characteristics? Lady began pulling, putting breakfast on the table. Duncan walked to the table, laid a rifle across one corner of it, and sat down. He poured a blackish, black, brackish liquid, a big stew pan, into the cups. God, he thought, what could I, what I, would give for a cup of coffee. Shortwell pulled up his chair. You didn't answer me. What is a Syria like? I don't know, said Duncan. Don't know, but you're going after it, looks like. And how can you hunt it if you don't know how? Don't know. Track it. The tried thing at the other end of the trail. Sure, it'll be the Cynthia. We'll find out what it's like once we catch up to it. We, the natives, are send up someone to go do the tracking for me. Some of them are better than a dog. Look, Gavin, I put you in a lot of trouble. And you've been decent with me. If I can be any help, I'd like to go. Two more, two make better time than three. We'll have to catch you, Cynthia, fast. We might sell down to endurance contests. All right, then. Tell me about this, Cynthia. Duncan poured porridge, gruel into his bowl, panned the pan to the well. It's kind of spiritual thing. Sort of a special thing. The natives are scared to death of it. Hear a lot of stories about it. Said to be unlike killable. It's always capitalised. Oh, always a proper noun. It's been reported at different times from widely scattered places. No one's ever bagged one. Not that I've ever heard of. Duncan prattled a padded rifle. Let me be, get a ba- be, bead on it. He started eating, spooning porridge into his mouth, munching on the stale cornbread left from the night before. He drank some blackish beverage and shuddered. Some day he said, I'm going to scrape to give enough money to buy a pound of coffee, you think? It's a freight rates, Chopwell said. I'll send for you a pound when I go back. Not at the price they charge to ship it out, said Duncan. I wouldn't hear of it. They had a silence for a time. Finally, Chopwell said, I'm getting nowhere, Gavin, and he's just willing to talk, but it adds up to nothing. I tried to tell you that. You should have saved your time. Short, short, well, short, well, took his hand, shook his head suddenly. There's an answer, a logical explanation. It's easy enough to say you cannot rule out the sexual factor. That's exactly what has happened to you here, Laywood. It's easy to explain that a sexless animal, a sexless race, sexless planet is impossible. 
But it's not that, that is what we have. Somewhere there's an answer. I have to find it. Now hold up a minute, Duncan protested. There's no use blowing a gasket. I haven't got the time this morning to listen to your lecture. It's not, it, but it's our lack, not the lack of sex that worries me entirely, Shotwell said. Although it's a central factor. There's subsequently situations deriving from the central fact that are most intriguing. I have no doubt, said Duncan, but if you please, about sex, there's no basis for the family. About the family, there's no basis for tribe. Yet the natives have an elaborate, elaborate tribal setup. The taboos by way of regulation. Somewhere there must exist some underlying basic under unifying factor, some commonly loyal loyalty, some strange relationship which spells out to brotherhood. Not brotherhood, said Duncan, chuckling. Not even sisterhood. You just must watch your terminology. The word is, that you want is ithood. The door pushed open and the native walked in timidly. The Hekira, the master bomb said that Mr. might want me, Nathan told him. I am Spira. I can track anything but screamers, scoop, dilbers, longhorns and delavanovans. Those are my taboos. I'm glad to hear that, Duncan replied. You have no Cynthia taboo, then? Cynthia? Ripped, yelped the native. Sir Caro did not tell me, Cynthia. Duncan paid no attention. He got up from the table, went to the heavy chest that stood, gives one wall. He rummaged on it. Came out with a pair of binoculars, a hunting knife, and an extra drum ammunition. A coaching table, he rummaged once again, filling a light small leather sack, gritty powder, from which he could, from a can he found. Rock on a home he explained to Shopwell. Emergency rations, full up by primitive Native American Indians, pouched corn, ground fine. It's no feast, certainly, but it keeps a man going. You figure you're going that long? You'll be gone that long? Overnight, maybe overnight, I don't know. I won't stop until I can get it. Can't afford it. It'll wipe me out in a few days. Good hunting, Shotwell. Said, I hold the fault, Duncan said to Sparrow. Quit sniffing him. Oh, come on. He picked up the rifle, settled the cock of his arm. He picked, kicked open the door and strolled out. Sipa followed meekly. Duncan got his first shot. Late in the afternoon, the first that, that first day, in the middle of the morning, a few hours after they left the farm, they flushed that Cynthia out of his bed in a thick ravine. But when there'd be no chance of a shot, Duncan saw no more than a huge black blur flayed in the bush. For the bait of an afternoon, they had followed its trail, Sparrow tracking and Duncan bringing up the rear, scanning every piece of cover, the sun hot rifle, always ready, at, held at ready. Once they'd been held up for 15 minutes while massive Donovan tramped down and forth, back and forth, screaming, trying to wake up its courage for attack. But after a quarter of an hour was showing off, it started to behave itself and went off a shuffling gallop. Donovan, Duncan watched it go with a faint, lot of thankfulness. He would, it could soak up a lot of lead and from, a, from all its wickedness, it was handy his feet once it set itself in motion. Donovan's have killed a lot of men in twenty years. This old man a came to leeward. Lord. The beast's gone. Duncan looked around for Sipa. He found it fell asleep beneath a hip pillow box scrub. He kicked the native awake, and in something less than gentleness, they went at on again. A bush swarmed at the other animals, but they had no trouble with them. Sipa! Despite its initial reluctance, it worked well at the trailing. A misplaced bunch of grass, a twig bent on one side, is patched, misplaced stone, the faintest pet mark. We see if a stock in trade, it worked it like a live, well back trained hound. This bush country was its special province. Here it is at a home. With the sun dropping towards the west, they climbed a long steep hill. And he reared the top of it. Duncan hissed at the zipper, and they to look back over his shoulder in surprise. Duncan made motions for it to stop tracking. Native crouched just and then the Duncan went past it. He saw the look of agony it was twisting its face. A look of agony it saw thought he saw, as well as a touch of pleading and a touch of hatred. It scared just like the rest of them, Duncan told himself. But well the native fault or felt had no significant what counted was the beast ahead. Duncan went to just a few yards 
and his belly pushing the gun ahead of him. Bogolot was bumping on his back, swift, voracious insects ran out of the grass and swarmed across his hands and arms. One got in his face and bit him. He made it to the hillstop and lay there, looking at the sweep of land beyond. More the same, more the blistering, dusty stogging, more the fawn and tangled ravine and elf or emptiness. He lay motionless, watching a, a hint of motion for a fitful shadow for any wrongfulness in the terrain that might be Sylvia. But if nothing, the land lay quiet under the declining sun, far on the horizon, a herd of some sort of animals glazing, grazing, but there was no nothing else. And he saw the motion, just a flicker on the knoll ahead, about halfway up. He laid a rifle carefully on the ground, hitched the binoculars round. He raised them to his eyes and moved away, slowly back and forth, and was there where he seen the motion. He was resting, looking back along the way, and him come, watching for the first sign of his trailers. Duncan tried to make out its size and shape, but it blended with the grass and the June gun's sun soil. But he could not be sure exactly what it looked like. He let the glasses down, and how? He had located it. He could distinguish it, his outline, with the naked eye. His hand reached for a slid, the rifle to him. He fitted it to his shoulder and wiggled his body to, for closer contact from the ground. Cross his centered on fate oh, out on a knoll when the beast stood up. It was not as large as he thought it might be, perhaps a little larger than earth line size. It certainly was no line, a square yet set thing and black and inclined to limpness. Lumpness had an awkward look about it, but there was strength and ferociousness as well. Duncan tilted the muzzle of the rifle so the crosshairs centred on the massive neck. He drew a breath and held it Again, triggered squeeze. Rifle buckled hard against his shoulder. Report it hammered in his head. The beast went down. It did not lurch or fall. It simply melted down and disappeared. Hidden in the grass, dead centre. Duncan assured himself. He worked the mechanism and the spent cartridge flew out. Reading mechanism stick, snickered. The fresh shell clicked as it slid into the breach. He lay for a moment watching on the knoll. Where the thing had fell on the grass was twitching as if the wind was blowing. Oh, there's no wind. Despite the twitching of the grass, there's no sign of Cynthia. He did not struggle up again. He stayed where it had fallen. Duncan got to his feet, dug out a banana and mopped his head. And he heard a soft thud of step behind him, turned, its, turned his head. It was the tracker. It's all right, Cynthia, he simpered. He said, you know, quit worrying. I've got it. We can go home now. It had been a long, hard case, chase, longer than he thought it would, might be. Been successful. Well, that was the thing that counted for the moment. Vurakup, Vurakup crop was safe. He tracked the trombana back in his pocket, went down the slope and back, but on a knoll. He reached the place where Cynthia had fallen. The three small grouts of thorn, mangled fur and flesh lying on the ground, and there was nothing else. He spun around and jerked his rifle up. Every nerve was screaming alert. He swung his head, searching for the slightest movement, for some shape or colour, and that was not the shape or colour of bush or grass or the ground, but there was nothing. Heat droned in the hush and afternoon. Not a breath of roving air. There was a danger. A sore two sense of danger close behind his neck. Simpa. Simpa. He... Called intense for a whisper. Watch out. Nathan stood motionless, unheeding. Eyebrows rolling up. There was only white. When the muscle stood out along its throat like a straining ropes of steel, Duncan slowly swiveled. Rifle almost at the arm's length. Elbows crooked a little. Ready to bring the weapon into play in the fraction of a second. Nothing stirred as no more. An emptiness, the emptiness of the sun, molten, molten, molten sky of grass and shaggy bush, a brown yellow land stretching into furthness, step by step. Duncan covered the hillside and finally came back to the place where the native squatted on its heels, a moan, rocking back and forth, arms locking tightly across his chest as if it tried to cradle itself in a sort of illusory comfort. The other man walked to the place where the Cynthia had fallen, picked up. One by one, a piece of bleeding flesh had been mangled by his bullet. They were limp. They had no shape. It was queer, he thought. 
In all his years of hunting over many planets, he had never known a bullet to rip out hunks, hunks of flesh. He dropped the bloody pieces back into the grass and wiped his hand with his thighs. He got up very little stiffly. He found no trail of blood leading through the grass. Surely an animal with a hole that size could leave the trail. As soon as, as he stood up, there upon the hillside with bloody foot, foot, fingerprints still wet, glistening upon the fabric of his trousers, he felt the first cold touch of fear, as if the fingers set of fear, let might momentarily, almost casually, a trailed across his heart. He turned around and walked back to the native, reached down and shook it. Snap out of it, he ordered. He expected pleading, cowering, terror, but there's none. Simpa got swiftly to his, its feet, stood firm, stood looking at him. There was, he thought, an odd glitter in his, glitter in his eyes. Get going, Duncan said. We still have a little time. Start circling and pick up the trail. I'll cover you. Glance the sun, an hour and a half still left. Maybe as much as two. They might still have time to get this button up before the full night. A half mile beyond the knoll, Sipa picked up the trail again and where he went ahead, but they were travelled more cautiously for any bush, any rock, or any clump of grass like a sealed and wounded beast. Duncan found himself on edge and curses of savagery for it. He'd been in this type of sorts of fall. There's nothing new to him. No reason for getting himself tensed up. A deadly business, sure, but that they had faced others calmly, walked away from with it, them. It was those frontier tales he heard about the Cynthia, kind of superstitious chatter, and one always heard on the edges of unknown land. He grabbed, gripped the t- rifle tighter and went on. No animal, he told himself, was unkillable. Half an hour before sunset, he called a halt and reached a brackish waterfall. The night soon would be getting bad for shooting, and morning he would take up the trail again. By that time, Cynthia would be an even greater, be a great, even greater advantage. It would, it would be stiff and slow and weak. It might be even dead. Duncan gathered wood and built a fire, a lee of thorn bush thicket. Simpa wiped, waded out the canteens and thrust them at Leon's length beneath the surface of the field. Of them, while the still was warm and evil tasting. It fairly free as scum, and the first year man could, could drink it. The sun went down, and darkness fell quickly. They dragged, they dragged some more wood out of the thicket and piled it into carefully close at hand. Duncan reached his pocket and brought out the little bag, Rocker Harmony. Here, he said to Simpa, Supper, Supper, and Ava held up one hand, cupped, and Duncan poured a few mound, little mound into a palm. Thank you, Mr. Simpa, said, food giver. Huh? Said Duncan, they caught, then caught what the native meant. Dive into it, he said almost kindly. It isn't much, but it gives you strength. We need strength tomorrow. Who give her? Trying to butter me up, perhaps a little while. In a little while, Simpa will start whining from him, for him. The knock of the hunt, head back for the farm. Though, to come to think of it, he really was a food giver to this bunch of sexless wonders. Corn, thank God grew well in the red and stubborn soil of Lake Bard. Good old corn from North America fed the hogs, made it a crone pone for breakfast back on earth, and there, large yard, the staple food crop of a gang of shifted varmints, still goddess of some solid, good solid scepticism, a round-eyed wonder, this unfilled idea, idea that one should take the trouble to grow plants to eat, to eat rather than go out and scrounge for them. Corn for New America, he thought, where he side by side with a very round of Langwood yard. It was another, that was the way it went. Something from one plate and something from the other. Still, any, any something further from a third. So it was built up through the wide so, social confederacy of space with truly cosmic culture, which in the end, in another 10,000 years or so, might spell out some way of life which some, so, with more sanity and understanding. Then was evident today. He pulled a mound of rock and money into his own hand and put the bag back in his pocket. Simpa, yes, Simpa, yes, mister. You are not scared today when the of them threatened to attack us. No, mister. Donovan would not hurt me. I see. You, you said that Donovan was taboo to you. Could it be that you likewise are taboo to the Donovan? 
Yes, mister. Devon and I grew up together. Oh, is that so? Oh, so that's it, said Oliver. Duncan put a pinch of parched and powdered corn in his mouth and took a sip of broken water. He chewed reflectively in a resilient, with a salt and mash. He might, he might go ahead, he knew. I asked why and how was, where's Simpia? Donovan had grown up, up together, but there was no point to it. That was exactly the kind of tangle that Shotwell was forever getting into. Half the time he told himself I convinced the little stinkers of going, doing no more than pulling our legs. What a fantastic boat of jerks, jerks, boat, not a man, not a woman, just things, and while they were never babies, they were children, always, although never less than eight or nine years old, it was, if, if they were no babies, where did the eight and nine year olds come from? I suppose he said, there's other things that, that were taboo, the stupid birds, the screamers, and like, also grew up with you. Yeah, that is right, mister. Some playground that must have been, said Duncan. Went on chewing, staring out of darkness beyond the ring of firelight. There's something in the form bush, mister. I didn't, I didn't hear it, a thing, little pattering, something is running here, there. Duncan listened closely. What Cynthia, what Cynthia said was true. Simpa said was true. A lot of little things were running in the thicket. More than the my, li- more likely mice, he said. He finished off his work with me and took a big extra swig of water gagging on it slightly. Get your rest, said he told Simpa. I'll wake you later if so I catch a wink or two, Mr. Simpa, Simpa said. I'll stay with you to the end. Well, said Duncan, somewhat startled. Well, that is decent of you. I'll stay to the death, Simpa promised earnestly. Don't strain yourself, said Duncan. Picked up the rifle and walked down to the water hall. Night was quiet and the land continued to have an empty feeling, empty except for a fire in the water hall. Little mice like animals running in the thicket. And Simpa, Simpa lying by the fire, curled up and sound asleep, already naked, with not a weapon in its hand, just a naked animal, the basic humanoid, yet with underlying purpose that, that at times of baffling, scared and shivering. This morning, a mere mention of Cynthia, but never floating on the trail, pure funk back. They all look now where they lost the feet fear, but were now ready to go to the death. Duncan went back to the fire and prodded Cynthia with his toe. The native came straight up out of sleep. Who's deaf? said Duncan. Who's deaf are you talking of? Why, you, you ours, of course, Sim, Simpa. And went back to sleep. Duncan did not see the arrow coming. He heard a swishing whistle and felt the wind of a great, although it, on the right side of his throat, and it thunked into a tree behind him. He leaped aside and covered, dived for cover, the tumbled mound of boulders. Almost instantly, his thumb pushed the fire of control, the rifle up to automatic. He crouched behind the trembled rocks and peered up ahead. There's not a thing to see, the hula hula trees. Shimmered in a blaze, the sun and the thin bush was grey and lifeless. Any things that stir were still three stilt birds walking gravely a quarter of a mile away. Simpa, he said, he whispered, here, mister, keep low, it's still out there. Whatever it may be, it might be, still out there and waiting for another shot. Duncan shivered, remembering the feel of the arrow pa- flying past his throat, hell of a wave for man to die. Alva tell owned of nowhere with an arrow in his throat, scared of stiff knees to looking down, heading back to home as fast as it could go. He flicked the control of the rifle back to a single fire, called around the rock pile and sprinted for a grove of trees, stood on the high ground, reached them as he flanked the spot from which the arrow must have come. He unlumbered the binoculars and glossed glassed the area. He still had no sign. Whatever was taken as pot shot at them had made its head a getaway. He walked back to the tree where the guerrero still stood, its point driven deep in the bark. He grasped the shaft and wrenched the arrow free. You can come out now, he said, called to Simpia. There's no one, Simpa. There's no one around. The arrow was unbelievably crude. The unfeathered shaft looked as if it had been battered up. Off the proper length with a jagged stone, the arrowhead, one flint, picked up 
from some outcropping or dry creek bed is awkwardly bound onto the shaft and the tough but pinned in a bark for the hula hula tree. Hula tree. You recognize this? It's your simper. Navy took the arrow and examined it. Not my tribe. Of course not your tribe. Yours would, wouldn't take a shot at us. Some other tribe, perhaps. Very poor arrow. I know that. But it could kill just as dead you just as dead as if I were a good one. Do you recognize it? No tribe made this arrow, Simpa declared. Child, maybe? What would a child? What would, what would child do out where they are here? That's what I thought too, said Duncan. He took the bat arrow back, held it in between his thumb and forefingers and twirled it slowly, terrifying thought rubbing, nibbling his brain. It couldn't be. Too fantastic, he wondered if the sun was finally getting to him. Then he had a thought, he had a thought it all, all, of it all. He had had a thought of it all. He squanted down and dug the ground and makeshift arrow point. Simpa, what do you actually know about the Cynthia? Nothing, Mr. And scared of it all. We weren't turning back. If there's something you know, something you could, we could, would, that would help us. Close as he could, could be to begging. Aid is further than he was meant to go. He should have not asked at all. He thought angrily. I do not know, the native said. Duncan cast the arrow to one side and rose to his feet. He cradled the rifle on his arm. Let's go. He watched Simpa trot ahead. Cranky little stinker. He told himself it knows more than it's telling. It told in the afternoon it was more, it was a possible hotter and drier than the day before. There was a sense of tension in the air. No, that was rot. Even if there were, a man must act as if they were not there. He let himself fall prey to every mood out in this empty land. He had only himself to blame for whatever happened to him. Tracking was harder now. The day before, the Sophia only ran away, straight line flee, fleeing up to keep ahead of them, to stay out of their reach. Now it was becoming tricky. He backtracked often in an attempt to throw them off. Twice in the afternoon, the trail blanked out entirely, and it was only after long searching that Simpa, Simpia, Simpa picked it off again, picked it up again in one instance a mile away from where it had vanished in thin air. This van- that vanishing bothered Duncan more than he would admit. Trails do not disappear entirely, not when the terrain remains the same, not when the weather is unchanged. Something is going on, something perhaps that's simple. No, you far more about than willing to divulge. He watched the native closely, and there seemed something, nothing suspicious. It worked, and in his work, it was for all to see the good and faithful hound. Late in the afternoon, the plane on which they'd been travelling suddenly dropped away. They stood poised on the brink of a great escarpment. Cramp- and looked far out to the great tangled forest and the flowing river. It was like, it was like a suddenly coming into another and beautiful room, one had not expected. His new land, never seen before by any earthman, for no one had ever mentioned that somewhere to the west the forest lay beyond the mesh. Man came, coming from space had seen it, probably, but only as a different colour maker marking on the planet. To them it made a difference, but the man who lived in Limyard, a plant and a trader and a trader, prospector and a hunter. It's important, I thought Duncan with a sense of triumph. I'm a, I'm the man who found it. Mister, now what? Out there, skun, skun. I don't. Out there, mister, across the river. Duncan saw it. Haze of blueness in a rift. A puff of copper moving very fast as he watched, heard a far off kneeling of storm. A shiver in the air rather than a sound. You watch in fascination. It moved along the river. I saw the body in fury it made out of the forest. It struck and crossed the river. And the river was for a moment seemed to stand at one end. Stand on end a sheet of silvery water splashed towards the sky. It was gone so quickly it was it happened. There was a tumbled slash across the forest. There was churning winds that travelled. Back on the farm, Zikara. I warned him of the scurran. There was a season for them, he said, and a man caught in one. Wouldn't have a chance. Duncan let his breath out slowly. Bad, said Simpa. Yes, very bad. 
Hit fast. No warning. What about the trail? Said Duncan. Did a Cynthia? Simpa nodded fell downward. Can we make it before nightfall? I think so, Simpa. Simpa answered. He was rougher than they had thought. Twice he went down blind trails that pitched off the sheer rock faces, opening into drops of hundreds of feet, and forcing them to climb again and find another way. He reached the bottom of his escape compartment. As a bright, brief twilight closed, they hurried to gather firewood. There's no water, but there's little there's still left in their canteens. It may do with that. After their scat meal of Svokabamoni, Simpa rolled himself onto a ball and went to sleep immediately. Duncan sat with back against his shoulder, which one day long ago had fallen to the slope above them, but still half buried in the soil. Down the ages has kept sifting down. Two days gone, he told himself. There was, was there, after all, some truth in the whispered tales made of Browns back at the settlements. There's no one should waste his time in tracking down Cynthia, since Cynthia was unkillable. Nonsense, he told himself. He get the hunt, yet the hunt and toughened the trail, come more difficult. Cynthia had much more cunning and lucid quarry. Where well, had run with him the day before. Now he thought to shake them off. If he did that the second day, why had he not tried to throw them off the first? What about the third day? Tomorrow? Shook his head, it seemed incredible. And an animal would become more vulnerable as the plant progressed. But it seemed to be exactly what had happened. More spooked, perhaps, more frightened. Only Cynthia did not act like a frightened beast. It was acting like an animal. It was going severally. Savvy in determination, as some, and that was somehow frightening. But far off the west, towards the forest, the river came to the laughter and the howling of a pack of screamers. Duggan leaned his rifle against a boulder and got up to a pole, made a wood on the fire. He stared out into the western darkness, listening to the racket, he made a wry face, and pushed a hand absently minded with his hair, put out a silent hope. The screamers would decide to keep their distance. It may they were something a man could do without. By him a pebble came bumping into down the slope. If I need to rest just short of the fire. Duncan spun around, thought his thing to do. He thought to camp and near the slope. If something big could start to move, it'd be out of luck. He stood and listened. The night was quiet. The screamers had shut up for a moment. Just one rolling rock in his hackles up. You'll have to get yourself in hand. He went back to his boulder. As he stood to pick up the rifle, heard the faint beginnings of rumble. He straightened swiftly the face of scrape scrap that blotted out the scar-strewn sky, and the rumble grew. One leap, it was sim- he was at Simpa's side. He reached down and grasped his native body arm. Jedi erect, held in his feet, Simpa's eyes snapped open, blinking, the firelight. The one was grown to a roar, and there was thumping noises, the heavy boulders bouncing, and beneath the roar the silky, anonymous rustle was sliding soil rocks. Simpa jerked his arm free. His arm free. Duncan's grip and plunged into the darkness. Duncan whirled and followed. They ran slumbling in the dark. Find him for the roar of the sliding, bouncing rock behind came a throaty roar of thunder that filled the night from the brim to brim. He ran. Duncan could feel the dread apprehension, the tipitation, the bust, gusty breath of the hurtling debris blowing on his neck, the crushing impact of boulder smashing into him, a gulfy flood of trim, trembling treacherous snatching his legs. A puff of bellowing dust came out and caught them, and he ran chokingly, Choking as well as stumbling off the left for them, a mighty crank of rock chugged along the ground in jerky, almost reluctant fashion. Then the thunder stopped. All one could hear was small sliverings and lesser debris as it trickled down the slope. Duncan stopped running and slowly turned around. The campfire was gone, buried, no doubt, beneath tons of overlay. The stars appelled before because the great cloud of dust was still bellowed up in the sky. He heard Simpa moving near him and reached out his hand, hand searching the tracker. 
Not knowing whether it, where it was, he found the native grasp his shoulder and pulled it up beside him. Simpa was shivering. It's all right, said Duncan. And it, it was all right, he assured himself. He still had a rifle. The extra drum of ammunition. Knife was on his belt. A bag of rockery in his pocket. Canteens were all they had lost. The canteens of the fire. We have to hole up somewhere for the night, Duncan said. There were screamers on loose. He did not like what he was thinking, nor the shot shape of fear that was beginning the crowd in upon, in upon him. He tried to shrug it off, but it still stayed with him, just out of reach. Simpa plucked at his elbow. Fall and thicket, mister. Over there, we must go inside. We must be safe for screamers. Do you still listen to music on cassette tapes? Do you still connect to the internet with dial-up? No? Then why are you still using a data warehouse? The data warehouse had a great run, but it's outdated. It wasn't built for 90% of today's data. It can't handle modern use cases like machine learning. It's time for a new paradigm. The Databricks Lake House brings all your data together on one open platform so you can tackle every use case from BI to AI. Discover Lake House at Databricks.com. Becoming a magician takes thousands of hours, right, Ashley? Oh, I'm not a magician. I'm a design specialist at the Container Store. But you transform closets and pantries. Well, I turn your most frustrating spaces into ones you love. With a magic wand? Uh, with Alpha, our customizable, adjustable, and affordable shelving and drawer system. The amazing Ashley, making daily frustration disappear. <laughs> Just doing my job. Transform your space with Alpha and save 20% on purchases over $500. Get started with your free design at the Container Store today. It's torture, they made it. Screamers are, are, and you are taboo, said Duncan. So they remember, how come you're afraid of them? Afraid of you, you, mister, mostly. Afraid of you, myself, just a little. Screamers could forget. It might not recognise me. It's too, too, it's too late, safer here. I agree with you, said Duncan. Screamers came and plodded, padded all through the thicket. The beast sniffed and crawled as the thorns reached them. They finally went away. When well, morning came, Duncan Simper. Simpa climbed the scrape, clambering over the borders and tons of rock, soil and rock, and covered a cramping place. Following the crash cut by the side, they clambered up the slope and finally reached the point of the side beginning. They have found the depression in which the poised slab of rock had rested. It was supporting soil, but dug away. They could be started, but pushed down the slope above the campfire. And above all that were deeply sunken pelt marks of the Cynthia. Now it was more than now it was just more than a hunt. The knife against the throat, kill or be killed. There was no stopping. There, when before there might have been, no longer sport. There was there was no mercy. That's the way I like it. Duncan told himself. He rubbed his hand along the rifle barrel. Saw the metal glints shine the moonday sun. One more shot, he prayed. Just give me one more shot at it. This time there'll be no slip up. This time there'll be no more. The three sudden hunks of flesh, a fur lying in a glass to mock me. He squinted his eyes against the heat shimmer, rising from the river, watching Simpa, hunkered again beside the water's edge. The native rose to its feet and trotted back to him. It crossed, said Simpa. It walked out as far as it could go. It must have swum. Are you sure? It might have waded out to make us think it crossed, then double back again. He stared at the purple green of the trees across the river. Inside that forest, it would be hellish going. We can look, said Simpa. Good. You go down the stream, I'll go up. An hour later, they were back. They found no tracks. They seemed little doubt. Cynthia had really crossed the river. They stood side by side, looking at the forest. Mister, we have come far. You are brave to hunt the Cynthia. You have no fear of death. Fear of death, Duncan said. Tully of infantile. It's beside the point as well. 
I know, not to tend to die. They waded out, out to the stream, bottom and shell gradually. They had to swim no more than a hundred yards or so. They reached the forest bank and threw themselves rest, flat the rest. Duncan looked back at the way they come to the east of the encampment with blue, dark blue smudge against the pale blue, brownish, brownish sky. Two days back of the lay the farm and that village field that seemed much further off than that. They were lost in time and distance. They belonged to another existence, another world. In life, all his life he seemed to him have faded, become a core forgotten, as if his moment his life had been only one that had counted, as if all the minutes and hours of all the breaths and heartbeats, wake and sleep, upon the towards a certain, a certain hour, upon a certain stream, the rifle moulded to his hand, and cool, calculated battle-lust, a killer riding in his brain. Simpa, finally got up and began to range along the stream. Duncan sat up and watched. Scared to death, he thought, yet it stayed with him. At the campment fire that first night, it is said it would stick to the death, and apparently it meant exactly what it said. It's hard, he thought, to figure out these are jokers. Hard to know what kind of mental operation, what series of emotion, what kind of brand of ethics, what variety of belief or faith go to make them and their way of life. It would not have been so easy, it been so easy for Simpa to have missed the trail and swear it could not find it. Even from the start, it could have refused to go, yet fearing he had gone, reluctant he had trailed, but any need of faithfulness and loyalty. Be loyal and faithful, but loyal to what? Duncan wondered to him, the outlander and the intruder, loyal to itself, or perhaps, although it seemed impossible, faithful to Cynthia. But what does Simpa think of me? he asked himself, and maybe more to point, what do I think of Simpa? Is there a common meeting ground, or if we despite, we despite humanoid forms, could they forever to be alien and part? He had a rifle across his knees and stroked it. Polishing it, patting it, making it even more closely. A part of him is his instrument deadliness, expression of his determination to track and kill Cynthia. Just another chance that he begged, just one more second, just, or even less, to draw a steady bead. That's all I want, all I need, to, uh, all I need, uh, all I ask. And he came back down across the space, and then left behind, back to the farm the field, back to the misty other life from which he had been so mysteriously divorced, which in time, and undoubtedly, would become real and meaningful again. Simpa came back. I found the trail. Duncan heaved himself to his feet. Good. They left the river and plunged in the forest. There was heat close, more merciless than ever. Humid, stifling heat. It felt like a soggy blanket wrapped tightly around the body. The trail lay plain and clear. The Cynthia now... His scene was far, was intent upon pulling of his lead without recourse of evasive, to evasive, to evasive tactics. Perhaps he had reasons with pursuers. Would lose with some time in the river. It may have been trying to stretch out the margin further. Perhaps it needed that extra time he speculated, instead of necessary machinery for another dirty trick. Simpa stopped and waited for Duncan to catch up. A knife, mister? Duncan hesitated. What ought for? I have a thorn in my foot, and he just said, I have to get it out. Duncan pulled a knife from his belt and tossed it. Simpo def- caught it definitely. Def- definitely. Looking straight at Duncan, with a flick of a smile upon his face, the knife cut his throat. He should go back, he knew, without the tracker. He didn't have a chance. The odds were now with Cynthia. If indeed they had not been with it from the very start, unfit killable, unkillable, it grew into intelligence to meet in emergencies. Unkillable because it pressed, it could fashion a bow and arrow, however crude. Unkillable because it had a sense of tactics, like rolling rocks at night with his enemy. Unkillable because his native tracker would killingly kill itself to protect the Cynthia. Sort of cross crisis beat, perhaps, unable to develop the intelligent abilities to meet it. Each situation and lapsed him back to level of non intelligence con- contentment. Then thought Duncan would be a sensible way of everything to be a way of everything to live. It would go away. It would do away with the inconvenience and irritability and discontentment. Intelligence when intelligence was indeed unneeded, but the intelligence and abilities which went with it would be there and st- safely tucked away 
and one could reach in and get them like the necklace of a gun. So they were used to be put away in the case might be. Duncan hunched down, hunched forward and with a stick of wood, pushed the fire together. Flames blazed up anew and sparks flying up the wisping darkness of the trees. Night had cooled off a little, but the humanity still hung on. A man felt uncomfortable. A little frightened too, Duncan lifted his head and stared up to the fire flickered darkness. There were no stars because the heavy foliage shut them out. He missed the stars, he felt but you feel better if you look up and see them. When morning came, he might go back. He might, he might, he should quit this hunt, which now came impossible, even slightly foolish. But he did not, he even knew he wouldn't. Somewhere along this Freedale Trail, he had become committed to purpose and challenge. He knew. That when Nominee came, he would go and get to it, go on again. Not hated that drove him, not vengeance, not even the trophy urge. Hunter lust that prodded men to kill something strange or harder, or to kill or, or bigger than any man been killed before. Something more than that. Some weird entangling of a symphony meaning with his own. He reached out and picked up the rifle and laid it on his lap. His barrel seemed gleamed duly in a flickering campfire light. He rubbed his hand along the stock of an, as another man by stroke of a woman's throat. Mister, said a voice. It did not startle him, for the word was softly spoken. A moment he'd forgotten that Simpa was dead, dead with a harsh smile, fixed in its face and its throat laid wide open. Mister, Duncan sniff, stiffened. Simpa was dead. There was no one else, yet someone had spoken to him. It was how... And there could be only one thing in his wilderness. Might speak to him. Yes, he asked. He did not move. He simply sat there with his wife on his lap. You know who I am? I suppose you want Cynthia. You're done well, said the Cynthia said. You did have made a splendid hunt. There's no dishonor if you decide to quit. Why don't you go? I, I promise you no harm. It's over there, somewhere in the front of him. Somewhere in the bush, beyond the fire. Almost across, straight across the fire from him, Duncan to himself, if he could keep it talking, perhaps he could even lure it out. Why should I, he asked. Hunt is never done until one gets the thing one is after. I can kill you, as I said, the Cynthia told him. But I do not want to kill you. It hurts to kill. That's right, said Sir Duncan. You're most perceptive. For he had picked it now. He knew exactly where it was. He could afford a look of mockery. He found set up the metal nudge to fire control to the automatic. He flexed his legs beneath him, so he could ride and fire in one single motion. Why did you hunt me? the Cynthia asked. You're a stranger in my world. You know no right to hunt me. Not that I of course I, of that my I mind, of course. In fact, I've only simulated. We must do it again when I'm ready to be hunted. I shall come and tell you we shall spend a day or two at it. Sure we can, said Duncan, rising. As he rose his crutch, he held the trigger down, and the sun gun danced in a sane flurry. The confessor flare, a flicking tongue, hatred and trail of death, hissing, spit frightfully in the underbush. Any time you might want to, you want to, yelled Duncan gleefully. I'll come and hunt you. You, uh, you just say the word, and I'll be on the trail. I, don't, I might even kill you. How do you like it, chump? He held the trigger on tight and kept his crutch so the slugs would not fly high, but would cut this way just above ground. He moved the muzzle back and forth lots so that it covered extra ground to compensate for any minute any miscalculations he might have made. The magazine ran out, the gun clicked empty, the vicious clatter stopped, powder and smoke drifted softly in the campfire light. The smell of it was of its most perfume, its nostrils, the underbreath, bash. Many little feet were running. The thousand frightened mice were scurrying from catastrophe. Duncan unhooked the retro magazine from where it hung by his belt and replaced the empty one. Then he snatched a length, burning length of wood from the fire and waved it frankly until it burst into blaze, becoming a torch rifle, grasped in one hand, torch the other. He plunged the underbreath, breath. Wretch. Little chittering things lied as fled to escape him. You do not find it, Cynthia. 
You found chewed up bushes and soil churned by flying metal. You found five lumps of flesh and fur. Those he brought back to the fire. Now the fear had begun, had begun, that had been stalking him kept just beyond his reach, walked out of the shadows and hunkered up to the campfire room. He placed a rifle within easy reach, ranged of five clumpy chunks on the ground, close to the fire, he tried with trembling fingers to restore them to the shape they were before the bullet struck them. That was not a good, that was a good one, he thought, by in grim irony, because that had no shape. There had been part of the symbiote that killed a symbiote inch by inch, not with a single shot. You are not the pound of flesh of its first time, and said next time, a shot off another pound of flesh. You got enough shots at, you, at it, you funny car, carve it down to size. Maybe it would kill it then. Maybe, although he wasn't sure, he was afraid, he admitted that. He was and squatted there and watched his fingers straight. He kept his jaw clump, clumped tight to stop the clatter of his teeth. The fear had been getting closer all the time. He knew he moved in by step but two when Simpa cut his, cut his throat. Why in the name of God had the downfall done it? it made sense at all. He wondered about Lord Simpa's loyalties, the very loyalties that he dismissed as a sheer impossibility. But an answer, after all, the end was from, from some obscure reason, obscure to humans, that is. Simpa's loyalty had been to Cynthia. But when there was no use of searching for any reason in it, nothing that had happened made it any sense. And it made no sense that a beast one was pursuing should end, should up and talk to one, although it did fit in with the theory of crossbreed beasts. Crossbreed fashioned in the mind. Progressive adaptation, he told himself, carrying adaptation far enough that he reached communication. But might not the Cynthia's power of adaptation be running down? The Cynthia had gone by the far as it could force itself to go. Maybe so, he thought. It would be worth a gamble, Cynthia's suicide, all its casualness, all the end tones of last notch desperation. And Cynthia's speaking to Duncan, tend to parley with him, contained a weight, note of weakness. They would have failed at the rock side, and failed, so that Cynthia, so had that, had Cynthia's death. What next about Simpar's death? What next would the Cynthia try? Had he anything to try? Tomorrow he'd find out. Tomorrow he'd go on. He couldn't back down, back, couldn't turn back now. Too deeply involved, he was always wonder. If he turned back now, whether another hour or two might have been, seen the end of it. There are too many questions, too many much mystery, and now far at stake, more, far more at stake in Tembro's Aurora. Another day he might have seen, made sense of it, might banish a dread walker to prod upon his heels, might bring some peace of mind, and it stood right at the moment, none of it made sense. It, but even as he thought it, suddenly one of the bits of bloody flesh and mangled fur made sense. Beneath the punching and prodding of his fingers, it assumed a shape. Breathlessly, Duncan bent over of it, not believing, not even wanting to believe, having, having Frank Frankly, he could prove it should prove completely wrong, but he was n- there was nothing wrong with it. Shape was there; it could not be denied. It somewhat fitted back in his natural shape. It was a baby screamer. Well, maybe not a baby, but it was at least a tiny screamer. Duncan sat back on his heels and sweated. He wiped his bloody hands up upon the ground. He wondered what shapes he'd find if he f- put the back in his proper place. Over hunks of limpness. It lay beside the fire. He tried and failed. They were too smashed and torn. He picked them up and tossed them back in the fire. He took up his rifle and walked across around the fire, sat down on his back against a tree, cradling the gun against his knees. Those little scurrying feet, he wondered, like a scampering of thousand busy mice. He heard them twice the night, the first night in the thicket and water hole, and more again tonight. And what could that simply be? Nothing, simply not. Certainly not, not a simple, uncomfortably murdering animal, he thought to start with. A high beast, a host animal, a thing marauding in many forms, so well trained to such deductions, might might made, make a fairly accurate guess. The shot well was not here. He was at the farm, fretting more than likely over Duncan's failure to return 
Finally, the first light of morning began to filter through the forest. It was not the glaring, clean white light of the open plain of bush, but of softened, diluted, diluted, fuzzy green light that matched the smouldering vegetation. Night noises died away, and the noise of the bird night. The night noises died away, and the noises of the day took up the soarings of the dancing exit insects, the screeches of hidden birds, and something far behind began, far away began to make a noise, sound like an empty barrel falling down a stairway, and like little coolness the night had dissipated, swiftly the heat clamped down, breathless, restless heat, and quivered in the air, circling, Duncan picked up the severe not more than a hundred yards from the camp, bees had been travelling fast, the plug marks had been sunk and Wide his space. Duncan followed rapidly as he dared. It was a temptation to follow a run. To match the Cynthia's speed, the trail was plain and flesh and fairly beckoned. What was wrong? Duncan told himself. It was too much flesh, too plain. Almost as the animal had gone to endless trouble, the human could not miss the trail. He stopped his trailing and crouched behind the side of a tree that did tracks ahead. His hands were too tense upon the gun, his body keyed too high and fine. He forced himself to take slow, deep breaths. He had to calm himself. He had to loosen up. He studied the tracks ahead. Four bunched pug marks and then a long leap interval. Then four bunched more bunched marks, tracks, and behind, between a set of marks of polished floor, his innocent smooth, too smooth perhaps, especially a third one for him, too smooth, and is that oh, something artificial? If someone had patted it with gentle hands to make it unsuspicious, Duncan sucked his breath in slowly, trap, or was his imagination playing tricks on him? If it was a, if it were a trap, he would have fallen into it if he had not kept following as he had started out. Now there was something else, a strange uneasiness. He stirred up quietly, faint, casting frankly to, for, for the clue to what, to what it was. He rose and stepped out from the tree, the gun at ready, with the gun at ready. What a perfect place to set a trap, he thought. While well, we'll be looking at the pug marks, ever spa- never space between them. Space between them will be natural ground. So he's just tried upon out upon old clever Cynthia. So he said, old clever, clever Cynthia. And now he knew what the other trouble was, the great uneasiness. It was a sense of being watched. So on the way up ahead, Cynthia was crouched, watching and waiting, anxious as it was ignorant. Maybe even with laughter rumbling in his throat. He walked forward, slowly forward until he reached the third set of tracks. He saw what might be, saw that he'd been right. The little area was smoother than it should be. Cynthia, he called. A voice was far louder than he might have meant it be. He stood astonished and a bit of brash. He realized why it was so loud. It was the only sound there was. A serious sunny had fallen and silent. Insects and birds were quiet and things at a distance had quiet, falling down the stairs. Even the leaves were silent. There was no rustle in them. They hang, le- leap upon the f- their stems. It was a feeling of doom and green light. It changed the copper light. Everything was still. The light was copper. Duncan spun around in panic. There was no place for him to hide. Before he could take another step, the stunk, skunk, skun, came and winds rushed out of nowhere. The air was clogged with flying leaves and debris. Trees snapped and popped, fumbled in the air. The wind held Duncan to his knees. He fought to bring his feet. He remembered the blinding flash of Tokwoko, how he looked from the top of the encampment. The body of furry winds and swayed swelling of the coppery mist. They are the trees of whip, whipped and muck, wheelworm fashion. He came half erect and stumbled, crawling the ground in attempt to get up again, while inside his brain an insistent, quirking voice cried out to him to run. Somewhere another voice said to lie flat upon the ground and dig in as best as he could. Another struck him from behind. He went back down. So he struck him from behind. He went down, pinned flat. His rifle wedged beneath him. He cracked his head against the ground in wild, world thickly and plastered his face with a handful of mud and tattered leaves. He tried to call and couldn't, but something had grabbed him by the ankle and was hanging on. Hey, pal, said Duncan. How, how are you making out? Cynthia did not answer. Sissy Pitt, said Duncan. Do you always den up luxury like this? But Cynthia didn't answer. Something queer was happening to Cynthia. It was coming all apart. 
Duncan watched them with fascinated horror. As if it broke down into a thousand lumps of motion and scurried in the pit and tried to scramble up its side, only to fall back down, face showers of sand. Amid the scurrying lumps, one thing remained intact, a fragile object that resembled nothing quite so much a stripped skeleton of Thanksgiving turkey, but it was most strongly Thanksgiving skeleton, but it fogged with pulsating life and glowed with steady violet light. Chittering and squeaking came out of the pit, a soft patter of the tiny, any tiny running feet. Duncan and I began to accustom to the darkness of the pit, began to make out the forms of such some scurry shapes with tiny screamers and some donovans, sawmill devils, a bevel of kill devils, and something else as well. Duncan raised a hand and pressed it against his eyes, then took it quick, took it quickly away. The little face is still there, looking as if beseeching him, a little shine in her teeth, a rolling White rolling of their eyes, he felt horror, wrenching his stomach, a sour, bitter taste of revulsion welled into his throat. But he folded it down, harking, harking back to the day at the farm, made before they studied to the, on the hunt. I could track down anything but screamers, stilt birds, longhorns, and donovans, Simpa, I said somnolently. They were to my taboos, and Simpa was also their taboo, for he had not feared the donovan. Simpa had been, however, somewhat fearful of screamers in the dead of the night. Because the native told him recently, screamers were forgetful. Forgetful of what? Forgetful of Cynthia's mother? Forgetful of the motley brood in which they have spent their childhood? Were they for what? That was the only answer to what was running the pit, the hole, and expected the answer, the enigma against which man, like Shockwell, frustrated banging their heads for years. Strange, he thought to himself, all right. It might be strange, but it worked. What difference did it make? The planet's decisions were sexless, because there was no need for sex. What was wrong with that? It might, in fact, Duncan submit himself, head off a lot of trouble. No family spats, no triangle trouble. No fighting over mates. Well, it might be unspiting. It might even... It did seem slight, right? So faithful. And since there's no sex as in species, the planetary mother, but more than just a mother, Cynthia... More than likely was mother, father, incubator, nursery teacher, and sometimes perhaps even many other things besides all rolled into one. In many ways he thought it might take make a lot of sense. Here natural selection would be ruled out and the ecology be controlled in considerable degree and mutation might be a matter of deliberate choice rather than random and hepatitis. It would be make for potentially planetary unit. Such as no other world has ever seen, known. Everything was they, everything here was akin to everything else. There was a planet, man from here was a man from planet where man or any other alien could learn to tread most subtly, for he was not conven- convinced feasible. In a crisis of clash of interests, might man find himself faced suddenly with undivided, covered in planet, with every form of life making common cause against the interloper. The little scary things are given up. They'd gone back to the places, clustered round the false inviolate of the Thanksgiving skeleton. There's one fitting place for until Cynthia took a shape again, as if Duncan told himself blood and nerve and muscle had come back from a brief vocation to form the beast anew. Mister, said Cynthia, what do we do now? You should know, Duncan said. You are the one who dug the pit. I spit myself, Cynthia said, and part of me dug the pit and the other... Part was stayed on the surface. Got me when the jump out when the jump was done. Convenience grunted Duncan. It was convenient. There were then what that was what what had happened to Cynthia when he shot it at it. He had split it into its component parts and got away. A night beside the water hole it split on him. Well him again in his form of its separate parts. The safety thickets. You have caught you're caught so am I, said Cynthia. Both of us will die here. It seems a fitting end to our occasion. Association. Do you agree with me? I'll get you out, said Duncan severely. I have no quarrel with children. He dragged the rifle full towards him and hooked the sling for the stock. Carefully lowered the gun by the sling and still attached the barrel down to the pit, into the pit. So if it reared up and grasped from its forepaws. Easy now, Duncan cautioned. You're heavy. I don't know if I can hold you. They didn't have to sleep and worry. The little one 
Rose would detach himself and scrambling up the rifle sling. He reached his extended arms and ran up them, scurrying claw, claws like sneering screamers and curling stilt birds and mice like drill devils. They snarled at him as they climbed. And a little grinning of natives, not babies, scarcely children, the little auditions of full grown humanoids, the weird Donovans scrambling happily. They came coming up his arms, across his shoulders, milled about his ground, around beside him, but even the others, and finally the Cynthia, not skinned down to bare bones of its Thanksgiving turkey size, but far smaller than them. They had been climbed awkwardly, out of rival and sling to safety. Duncan hauled the rifle up, twisted himself into a sitting position. Cynthia, he saw, was reassembling. He watched with fascination of restless miniatures, but his life swarmed and seethed like he were bays. One, each one click in place to form another beast, type beast. And now the Cynthia was complete. It's small, still small, no more than lion size. But it's, it's such a little one, Zavi had argued in the morning at his farm. Such a young one, just as a young brood, no more than circling infants. Circling was a word, not even some kind of wild approximation. No, the months or years, Cynthia would grow, growing with diverse children. Until it become a monstrous thing. He stood there looking at Duncan and the tree. Now, said Duncan, if you push on the tree, I think, between the two of us. Too bad, the Cynthia said, and wheeled itself about. He watched it go lumping off. Hey, he yelled. We didn't stop. He grabbed up the rifle and had it halfway in his shoulder. We remembered how absolutely futile it was to shoot at Cynthia. He put let the rifle down, a dirty and grateful double crossing. He stopped himself. That was not profit. Uh, no profit. Rage. When you were in a jam, what did what? It, what in a jam, you did the best you could. You figured out the problem and picked out the course, seemed best, and you didn't panic at the odds. He laid a rifle in his lap and started to hook up the sling. If not that, if not till then, he saw the barrel was packed with dirt, sand, and dirt. He sat numbly for a moment, thinking back to how close he'd been to firing Cynthia. It barreled and packed hard enough to deep enough. He would have had an exploding weapon in his hands. He had used a rifle as a crowbar. No way, which is no way he could use a gun. In one way, he told himself, that was guaranteed to ruin it. Duncan hunted again, round again, around, and found a twig and dug a clogged muzzle. But the dirt was jammed too firmly in it. He made little progress. He dropped the twig he was hunting, for some another struggle one when he caught the motion near by lump of cloth brush. He so watched closely for a moment, and nothing. He resumed the hunt with a stronger twig, found one and started him poking a muzzle, and there was another flash of motion. He twisted around no more than thirty feet away. The screamer sat easy on his haunches, his tongue was lowing about. It looked like a grim like a grin upon its face. There was another just at the edge of the clump of bush. He caught most of the motion first. There still there were others as well. He knew he could hear them sliding through the tangle from the trees. Could sense the soft padding of their feet. The execution as he thought. The Cynthia certainly would not wait any time. He raised a rifle. Wrapped the viral smoothly. A fallen tree trying to dislodge the obstru- obstruction it bore. It didn't budge. Barrel still packed with sand. But then no matter. Have to fire anyhow. Take whatever chance there was. He shoved. The control to automatic and tilted up the muzzle. There were six of them, sitting in a ragged row, grinning at him. Not in Harry, was sure of him. There no hurry, there was no hurry. He'd still be there when they decided to move on. In. And there were others, all the sides of him. Once he started, he couldn't, didn't have a chance. Be his, his fancy gents, he told them. It astonished, how, it cut, how, it, it shows how calm, how cold the objective it could be. Now the chips were down, but that was the way it was, he realised. He thought a long while ago, a man might suddenly find himself face to face, aroused a corroding planet. Maybe this was it in minister. So if he was obviously past the world alone, man back there needs killing. Go and get him. Just like that, for Cynthia, we have power here. A life force, a giver of life, a designer of life. Recipe of all in life and animal life on the entire planet. There's more than one of them, of course, p- probably. The home districts, spears of influence and responsibility mapped out. Each one with power to stream its own district. 
Monorism. He thought with a sour grin. Monorism. The absolute peak. Now, let's he told himself, it wasn't too bad a system. You wanted to consider yourself very objectively. But he was, he was in a poor position to be objective. But that or anything else. The screamers were inching closer, hitching themselves forward slowly on their bottoms. I'm going to get up to bed lying in for you, critics, Kirk called out. Just two feet further up that rock, I'll let you have it. We'll get all six of them, of course. The shots would be signal for the rain or rush of all other animals sinking in the bush, sulking in the bush. For he were, if he were free, he was on his feet. Possibly he beat them off. But pinned as he was, he didn't have a chance. It, was, it would be all over less than a minute after he fired his open fire. He might, as he figured, last as long as that. Six inch, six inch closer, he raised a the rifle. There, but they stopped and moved no further. Their ears lifted just as little as if they might be listening, and the grins dropped from their faces. They squirmed uneasily and assured a look of guilt. And all like shadows, they were gone, melting away so softly, they scarcely saw them go. Duncan sat quietly listening, but could hear no sound. A pretty thought, not for long, somebody had scared them off. But a while, they might be back. He had to go out of here. Get out of here. I had to make it fast. He could, uh, he could find it a low, longer lever. He could, find him, he could move the tree as a branch slanting up the tree topside. For the tree, almost four inches of butt, he carried it in, in, in diameter well. He set the knife in his belt and looked at it. Too small, too thin, he thought, to chisel through a four-inch branch. But that was all he had. The man was desperate enough, though. His life depended on it. He'd do anything. He hitched himself along the ceiling, lying towards the point from where the branch protruded from the tree. His pinned leg protested stabs of pain as his body wrenched it around. He gritted his teeth and pushed himself closer. Pain slashed through his leg again, like still long inches from the branch. Tried once more and gave up. Lay panting on the ground. It was just one thing left. You have to pick, try to hack out a notch in the trunk. Just by his leg. No, that would be impossible. But he'd be cutting into a wall or twisted rain of a base of supporting folk. Neither that or cut off his foot. And more than that was even more impossible. Man could faint before he got that job done. Useless, he knew. And no could do either one. There was nothing to do. For the first time he admitted to himself he might stay here and die. He shot well back at the farm in a day or two might set a hundred for him. The shot well would never find him. Anyhow, one nightfall, he soon as scream was back. He laughed gruffly his throat, laughing at himself. Simply one, the hunt hands down. He used a human weakness to win. He used the human, same human weakness to achieve a viciously poetic vengeance. After all, what could one expect? One would, could not equal human ethics, the ethics of Cynthia. Might not human ethics, in certain cases, seem as weird and illogical, as famous and grateful as an alien? He hunted a twig for a twig and began working again to clean the, clean the rifle ball. Freshing behind him, twisted around. He saw the Cynthia. Behind the Cynthia, he stalked a dominion. He tossed away the twig and raised his gun. No, said Cynthia sharply. Donovan trembled purposely toward the Duncan, but the prickling in the skin along his back. It was a fearful thing, frightful thing. Now he could stand before Donovan. Screamers turned tail rain. And they had heard it a couple of miles or more. Donovan named for the first time human. Donovan was named for the first known human to be killed by one. First was one was many. The role of Donovan Richards reigned long, and no wonder Donovan fought. It was closest he had ever been to one of the beasts. He felt a coolness creeping over him, like an elephant, a tiger, a grizzly bear wrapped in safe same hide. The most vicious fighting machine ever been spawned. He lowered a rifle. There'd be no point in shooting in two quick strides, the beast would be upon him. Donovan almost stepped on him, and he flinched away, then the great head lowered a gave the shrewd tree a butt, a tree bounced for a yard or two. The Donovan kept on walking, powerful muscles stern, moved in the bush and out of sight. Now we are even, says Cynthia. I had I had got I had to get some help. Donovan grunted, he flexed his leg. He'd been trapped, he could not feel the foot. Using rifle as a cane, put himself erect. 
He tried putting weight on the injured foot, and he screamed with pain. He braced himself with a rifle and rotated his so faces to Cynthia. Thanks, pal, said. I don't think that you'll do it. Will you not hunt, will you not hunt me now? Duncan took, he shook his head. Oh, go in no shape for hunting. I'm heading home. It was Avara, wasn't it? That's why you hunted me. Avara is my life, said Duncan. I cannot eat, let you eat it. Cynthia stood silently. Duncan watched it for a moment. Then he wheeled. But using a rifle as a crutch, he started hobbling away. Sylvia hurried to catch him, up with him. Let us make a bargain, mister. I will not eat a father, and you will not hunt me. You, is that not fair enough? It is fine with me, said Duncan. Let's shake on it. Put on a hand and the Sylvia lifted up paw. Shook some oldly, but very somely. Now, the Sylvia said, I see you home. The screamers would have you before you got out of the woods. They halted on a knoll, but oh, they let them the fade the farm, where the vera rose straight and green and red soil of the fields. You make, you can make it from here, said Cynthia, said, 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 said. A wearing fin is an awful effort to keep her being smart. I want to go back to ignorance and comfort. It was nice knowing you, Duncan said politely. Thanks for sticking with me. He stared down the hill, leaning heavily on the rifle crutch. He's frowned and troubled and back to back, back, back. Look, he said, you go back to the animal again. Then you will forget. One of these days you'll see all that nice tender ruler and very simple, says Sophia. You find me in the burrow? Just begin handing me. With, with, with you after me? I will quickly get smart. Remember, once again, it'll be all right. Sure, agreed Duncan. Oh, well, I guess that'll work. Sophia watched him go stumbling down the hill. Aaron all it thought. Next time I will brood. I think I'll raise a dozen like him. Turned around and headed up the bush. Felt intelligence slipping from it, like the old and carrying comfort coming back again. They glowed with anticipation, seethed with happiness and a big surprise they had in store for, for his newfound friend. Would it be happy and surprised when they dropped at them at the door? He thought, would it be, would he ever be will he ever be pleased? Becoming a magician takes thousands of hours, right, Ashley? Oh, I'm not a magician. I'm a design specialist at the Container Store. But you transform closets and pantries. Well, I turn your most frustrating spaces into ones you love. With a magic wand? Uh, with Alpha, our customizable, adjustable, and affordable shelving and drawer system. The amazing Ashley, making daily frustration disappear. <laughs> Just doing my job. Transform your space with Alpha and save 20% on purchases over $500. Get started with your free design at the Container Store today.